Good afternoon, and welcome to Grit in Flux, Leading with Perseverance and Flexibility with Dr. Angela Duckworth and Dr. Sharon Ravitch. Today's webinar is brought to you from the Center for Professional Learning with the University of Pennsylvania Graduate School of Education. The Center for Professional Learning designs and delivers professional learning opportunities that support educators, leaders, policymakers, entrepreneurs, and other professionals to deepen their knowledge, build their networks, and grow their careers. In addition to today's webinar, the Center for Professional Learning will offer many professional learning opportunities this summer. A few of these opportunities are, are listed here on your screen. We hope that you will consider joining us. For more information, please go to www.gse.upenn.edu slash professional dash learning. And now to moderate our webinar, please welcome Taylor Hausberg. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Taylor Hausberg and I'm an EDD student at the University of Pennsylvania's Graduate School of Education. The world around us is changing. Now more than ever, we need leaders who inspire us to navigate these big and small changes with perseverance and flexibility, with commitment and compassion. But what does this look like? How do we know when to hold true to our goals and when to let go? In the education world, leaders at every level, from policymakers leading entire school systems to teachers leading classes of students, must be prepared to answer this question for themselves and to help others do the same. That's why we at the Penn GSE Graduate Center for Professional Learning have organized this special and timely event, a conversation between Angela Duckworth and Sharon Ravitch on leading with grit and flux. Dr. Angela Duckworth is a distinguished professor of psychology at the Penn School of Arts and Sciences. She is perhaps best known for her New York Times bestseller, Grit, The Power of Passion and Perseverance. Dr. Duckworth is also the co-founder and CEO of Character Lab, a nonprofit whose mission is to advance scientific insights that help children thrive. In 2013, she was named a MacArthur Genius for transforming our understanding of the roles that grit and self-control play in achievement. Angela, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Taylor. I'm looking forward to it. Dr. Sharon Ravitch is a professor of practice at Penn GSC. Dr. Ravitch is a Fulbright Fellow, a GIAN scholar of the Government of India, and co-founded Penn's Inter-American Educational Leadership Network. Her areas of expertise include sustainable leader and organizational development, durable assets-based organization strategy, and applied qualitative and participatory research. Dr. Ravitch's recently published work on flux pedagogy and flux leadership has become a primary support framework for leaders and practitioners to explore what it means to take an emergent and humanizing approach to leading, teaching, and learning in this pandemic moment. Sharon, welcome. Thank you so much, Taylor. Great to be here. Hi, Angela. <laughs> In the next 40 minutes or so, I'll begin by asking Angela and Sharon a few questions. Our team will be taking notes in the chat box to help you follow along. If you all have any questions that come up as we're talking, please type them in the Q&A window. If we have time at the end of our conversation, we'll address a few of your questions. So this is a webinar about leadership. And Angela, Sharon, you both study topics that are highly relevant to leaders, namely grit and flux. So let's start with grit. Angela, what is grit and what led you to study it? I define as a psychologist, I define the word grit as passion and perseverance for long-term goals. And I started studying it because I felt as a former classroom teacher who was beginning her career in psychology, that talent and intelligence were 
kind of obsessions, especially in the United States. And I had felt in my classroom that all of my students were smart enough to learn the math that I was teaching. So I got really interested in the other things than talent or ability uh, or natural ability, if, if, if you want to call it that, that really make a difference in life. And I'll just say that, um, you know, I know this is going to be a great conversation and I absolutely don't think that grit is the only thing kids need. It's just that, you know, it's what I specialize in as a scientist. Sure. Thank you for that reminder. And Sharon, what about flex, flux pedagogy and mindset? What is that and how did you come to it? Thank you. So I began my career as a counselor and studied to become a psychologist. And I shifted into educational anthropology and specifically my interest became community-based um, inward out development. And so across the past decades, I've been engaged in applied participatory research, leadership development, organizational development, community-based activism in crisis-impacted countries, in conflict zones, in what so-called failed states, and in populations with forced migration and in agrarian economy seasonal migration. And so engaging in those kinds of endeavors, building an educational model in rural Nicaragua, in coffee farm communities, really attuned me to the fact that much of the world lives in an intentional relationship to flux and have created strategies and resources and knowledges and relational frameworks to advance what we all know um, we need around the world. And so that work really led me to look at frameworks for knowledge sharing and um, expertise what I think of as, and what I'm developing as a model of distributed wisdom, how are knowledges and skills, if everyone is an expert of their own experience, which I do believe, then we have to sink into and, and really create space and process for non-deficit oriented approaches to everything that we do, or rather better said, asset-based approaches. Um, and so that work led me to really understand and really just think about as much as anyone can understand and think about the role of belief systems in systems and the relationship of that to equity. And so for me, all of that and you know, uh, the amalgamation of the things that I've learned that have helped me think about how to engage with people in professional development, learning, counseling, teaching, whatever it is, led me to flux mindset, flux pedagogy, flux leadership. There are a lot of different uh, terms we could use for it. And so very quickly, I'll just talk about a few of the key nodes of um, the flux model. And it really begins with an inquiry stance, which pushes into traditional knowledge hierarchies and really repositions everyone as a knower and everyone as a learner. So it pushes into what I've called in my work, the expert learner binary. And in that, the leader, the teacher, the whomever it is, all of us, we reposition ourselves in relation to um, an understanding that everyone has valuable knowledge and that it's also not just knowledge, right? The preoccupation with knowledge is very Western. So inquiry stance is sort of an overarching framework. And then in this moment, you know, being trained as a psychologist and working as a counselor, trauma-informed work has always been a part of what I've done and in the kind of research I do, trauma-informed interviewing, which a lot of people think is just a sensitivity to the trauma that is in the room. It is that. It is also a profound exploration and uh, appreciation for the resilience of individuals and groups um, that have been able to uh, create and move beyond trauma. Mm -hmm. And so that became a very central node because we are all in a period of collective trauma. We also know that trauma is ubiquitous and largely ignored in schooling systems. And that's one of the reasons I appreciate Angela's framework. Um, so then critical pedagogy is about understanding society critically and cultivating the conditions for people to create the conditions for their own agency development. I connect that with what I see as disruptive equity frameworks like Howard Stevenson's racial literacy model. And I have the great honor and fortune of teaching with Howard. And we use this model for racial literacy and the explication exploration with students and, and leaders 
of identity related stress. And so that and this brave space pedagogy, which then applies what we learn about our own racial literacy to the ways that we're able to lead, be in and understand um, racial and identity based and power based dynamics. So all of these different pieces of this flux heuristic are really about criticality of place, person, process, and of possibility. And so from my perspective, they come together as a heuristic and all of them are important as we re-envision the future and build back something quite different than what we've come into this pandemic from. So we might think of leadership as existing in two dimensions. There's this intrapersonal dimension of leadership, which we sometimes call self-leadership. And then there's an interpersonal dimension or leadership as it relates to others. So Angela, when I hear people talk about grit, they're usually talking about it as it relates to intrapersonal development and leadership. But in a Harvard Business Review article published in 2018, you and your co-authors suggest that teams and organizations can be gritty in the same way that individuals can be gritty. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, I think that it's important, by the way, to emphasize that um, you know when you think about interpersonal capabilities and dispositions that we hope kids will grow up to have, that they are really important and they're not the same thing as grit. And that is, you know, yet another way which grit is incomplete. So as a mom, for example, I want my kids to be kind, <laughs> right? And I think the whole country needs a huge dose of empathy um, and, and authentic compassion. And those are not the same as grit. Those are really interpersonal mm -hmm. um, capabilities and dispositions. So, um, so how does this you know, connect with organizations and, and what did I write about? Well, I wrote that article with my cousin, Tom, who is a doctor and he said, we're going to write an article about organizations and we're gonna write about healthcare organizations. And I said, okay. I was wondering how you, how you two ended up in a partnership. <laughs> yeah, first cousin. Uh, so uh, so uh, it, it did give an op me an opportunity to say something um, about what I think is true. I don't have any data on it, but it seems to me that if you think of a gritty individual as somebody who has um, a, like a personal mission statement, like there's there's a there's a reason for being. It's not that they are you know just checking off their to do list, but if you ask them why um, they are doing these things, you know why did you become a teacher? You know why do you care about um, you know equity? There's there's a real why, and that is their top level goal or their mission statement. But I think at the at the organizational level, it's a macrocosm of the same thing. I mean, great schools, great organizations, um, even I'd say great companies, you know, there is a top level goal, there's a purpose. Um, and typically I think, uh, not always, because history has examples uh, to the contrary, but often is a very noble um, vision. Like people I think are uh, most motivated by their values. That's where it does get a little fuzzy because then somebody can be really gritty about something which is pro-social. And I think that's the ideal, but I, but I don't want to like make gritty into this amoeba that covers everything. It's like, no, let's, let's let the interpersonal things that we care about uh, kids developing be their own thing. And, mm -hmm. and I, I do think grit is more of an intra-personal thing, which is why we need to make sure the conversation is complete and it's not just about you know, building grit in kids. Sure, yeah. I love that. I, it, it's so interesting. Um, so you know, flux pedagogy comes from a relational psychology framework. Um, I work with Carol Gilligan um, over many, over decades. And, and yet it, it really, from my perspective, um, the question that uh, for me, it's an outward facing relational framework. It's also an inward facing framework because there is no equity. There is no rebuilding in an equitable way without critical self-reflection. It's simply not possible. That's not a possible thing. Um, and so we have to be, as Angela says, very gritty, very passionate about and very, very perseverant towards the ongoing intentional work on self that it takes to advance equity as a leader, as a teacher, as in anyone, as a parent. Um, and to my mind, and this is work I've done with Mike Nuckala over many years, we have talked about critical meaning societally contextualized critical self-reflection as an ethical stance for professionals and for applied developmentalists, psychologists, counselors, 
uh, teachers, leaders in, in applied fields. Um, and so it's important to say one's proximity to power in a, in, in a US, you know, in a Western white dominated, deeply inequitable country, our proximity to power, both macro and in our settings, the more proximity to power we have, the less authentically we see ourselves. We know that power contorts self-perception. And so part of a flux mindset, it really is about that inward remit and responsibility to oneself to move the dial. We all know we have biases and assumptions and that we do injury to other people and we microaggress. We know that. We need to normalize that, right? We need to normalize bias. We need to normalize circulations of power and who to whom power is conferred upon or on whom. Um, and so for me, the accountability with compassion piece of the flux mindset is very much about, it's about being proactive in one's compassion, right? Not just when a crisis comes up in your compassionate listening ear, but about creating like our Dean at the Graduate School of Education, Pam Grossman, I think does really well creating a culture of compassion, creating a culture where people feel listened to and a part of a whole and valued. And so from my perspective, that's about being proactive. That was already in place before the pandemic, but then with the pandemic, really moving into uh, that kind of way of thinking about things. And so I think about a flux mindset as one's personal contribution to the response and personal contribution to and responsibility to the relational conditions of uh, equity and of, you know, equity means optimal learning in schools. Equity means non-abusive relationships. Equity means self-care, right? So when I say equity, I mean it across contexts. Um, and part of that personal contribution and responsibility to understanding these relational conditions is criticality about self and criticality around social identities, right? We're all carrying very different things into this pandemic. Um, and to not be very attuned to that as a leader, as a teacher, does violence to the people you are responsible to serve or we are responsible to serve. And so that also means naming harmful norms and really, I think, um, getting very gritty about the passion of thinking about how do I work on self as not in a me search way, as some say, but in a, I actually know I have some very deep work to do in order to be a good ethical, whatever it is. So both in, in listening to, to both of you talk about grit and flux, uh, it sounds like so much of um, both of those principles deal with how, to res how we respond to challenges, like for instance, uh, school closures in the midst of a pandemic. And Sharon, uh, in, in one of your articles you wrote, but I think that both of you would agree, that it's important for leaders to maintain high but humanely calibrated goals and expectations. And so Sharon, what are a few tips that you have for leaders who are trying to strike this really difficult balance between high and calibrated? Yeah, that's a wonderful question because we know that we need to progress as we care, right? Like both need to happen in tandem. And so um, this notion of flux leadership, which I'm actually working on with the mid-career doctoral program in educational leadership at the Graduate School of Education, we're actually working on a volume of educational leaders writing about their leading right now in this flux moment. And so that's really nourished my understanding of what leaders are thinking and doing and giving and needing. And so I'd say a few quick things. The first is that leaders need to have as a part of their intention, as a part of their passion and perseverance, their vision of co-creating the conditions for collective thriving. It is precisely their responsibility. Um, I listened to um, Angela, I love the Harvard Business Review quarantined interview that you did a, a week or so ago. And I'm going to quote you because I loved something that you said, you said, Gritty leaders are, er, have an aerodynamic hierarchy of goals. And I love that. I nerded out for like a whole week on that and just obsessed about it because it really, it's what I'm talking about in terms of the, it's grit in flux that there's this way in which if you're doing that, if you're thinking that, if you're 
aspirationally working towards that, you can be more responsive. You don't have to have figured it out, but you have to have the intention or, or want to have to cultivate the intention. And so a part of this is about renorming um, with a primacy placed on equity, renorming organizations, renorming families, renorming classrooms, systems, advisories, whatever it is. Um, and renorming is where the brave spaces piece, Arayo and Clemens work around brave spaces comes in um, because brave spaces, this concept is that safe spaces are a, are a white mythologized construction and usually white male, the closer you are to power, the more your communication style is valued and affirmed and the less close to that ax those axes of social identity based and group based power the less so. And so that is a really important piece of renorming is about understanding this racial literacy. How are we all having racialized identity, stress related things during COVID? How do we process those? In, in my piece, there are a lot of suggestions around collective storytelling and different ways that can actually be integrated into meetings and classes um, in, in very effective and efficient ways. And so a piece of that is also about this critical pedagogy framework, which is about people being critical about society and understanding that they can be agentic in society, that everything is not just done to them, even though a lot of things are done to a lot of people, but it's about in their own locale, really creating the conditions for their own emancipation, their own agency development. Teachers do that, leaders do that, professors do that, counselors do that, therapists do that. Right, this is the work that we do as applied developmentalists. And so to reckon and reset these new norms to these higher order goals, um, these you know, visions of equity, we can't do it alone. That's where distributed leadership and distributed wisdom come in. And you need a lot of humility as a leader. And you need to really go back into that inquiry stance where you deposition yourself as the frontal teacher. And you realize that everyone is in a circle, no one is in the center. Um, and so the last thing I'll just say is that I think um, disengaging from norms that don't serve us is a good way for leaders to think. What norms don't serve us? What habits, rituals, routines don't serve us? Not only don't serve us in this moment, but won't serve us in the future. And creating ways to track that so that we have in different organizations and systems, um, we can look back to that as we're building forward. And so, you know, for me, all of this rests on the ability to be accountable to yourself and then accountability with compassion for others, to be compassionate with yourself, you know, and then compassion with others. The last thing I'll say, which is a little bit of a right turn, it might seem, is that leaders really need to process our own mental health issues and our own stresses very proactively. So your imposter syndrome or your communication style or your anxiety, right? That really needs to be processed away from the people you work with, um, unless it's work specific. As a leader, you really need to do your work so that you're showing up to lead, to inspire, and to motivate, having worked out some of your stuff um, already so that you can really model calm. Thank you, Sharon. Angela, I heard Sharon mention several of the ideas that you draw on as well, such as uh, you know having a clear top level goal and letting that drive your goal hierarchy. Is, is that how you think about calibrating and committing and, and striking that balance between the two? Well, I need to give credit for the phrase aerodynamic goals to Will Smith, who I have a total crush on, so I hope he's listening. Um, of course, he's from Philadelphia, so we should all uh, be loyal to Will for lots of reasons. Um, and he used that phrase to talk about how, you know, we all have these kind of like micro goals, if you will, like the things I got to get done at three o'clock today, you know, my to-do list, but then you might have some medium term goals, like things that you really want to see happen in the next year or two. Um, and then, of course, I think that it's a great Thing to have a top level goal or it really something where you could say like this is at the core of who I am uh, my deepest personal and moral values and that drives everything so when Will Smith said having an aerodynamic goal system I think he meant um, that these things are aligned and so that when you think about what you have to get done at three o'clock that should be consistent with and advancing um, what 
what your medium term goals are and your top level goals. And I like the phrase that uh, Sharon uh, used um, about like what doesn't serve us, you know, like the rituals, the mindsets, the routines, the things on your to-do list that are not serving, you know, your, your core values, your, your highest level goal, then we should let go of those. So anyway, that's where this um, uh, particular phrase came from. But psychologists, I think, generally acknowledge that human beings tend to have these goals that at different levels. We have, you know, low level goals. We have higher level goals that are more abstract. And I think that's where to me, when I, my understanding of flux, but I'm a beginner, so Sharon's going to have to tutor me. Um, you know, when I think about where you should be gritty versus where you should be more flexible, you should be pretty stubborn, I think, about your core personal values, right? Like if you got into teaching yes. because you really care about kids, Absolutely. like don't give up because there was a pandemic, right? right? right. Like, yeah. like don't give up because there's an equity, like hold fast to that, but then be super flexible, you know, down at the bottom, like, oh, looks like we're not going to be in person. Well, we're going to switch to like distance learning and, you know, really all great educators know that. I mean, uh, that, that, that to me kind of like almost defines what somebody is, you know, working with, right. with uh, young people. So anyway, so that I think is where our work um, complements, you know, quite nicely. And um, I, I think it's, uh, I'll just end, there's a, there's a person that I admire um, named Kat Cole, and she um, she actually was a Hooters waitress, and then she turned into a CEO. I think she was like yeah. the youngest CEO of a you know large large um, food service business, and she said, "I'm like water." And I was like, how are you like water? And she was like, I know where I'm going, but you know, oftentimes where you're going is blocked. So you got to be like water and go, you know, go through another tr crack. And I, when I, when I um, started reading Sharon's work on flex, it, like it just brought to mind Kat Cole and thinking like, uh -huh. yeah, you know, you have to be flexible, but it doesn't mean you have no direction, right? Exactly. You know, you're, yep. so anyways, I don't know if that resonates with you, Sharon, but that was- Yeah, my no, it does. I love that because, right. I think that this, the flux framework, as a heuristic could feel kind of out there. And I love this notion of that the passion and the perseverance, perseverance and those higher level goals and that vision, it's, yes, it's about teaching really well today or leading really well today. It's about pushing us forward as a society, as a system. So I love, you know, that notion of we're working towards goals in the here and now, for the here and now, for, ne you know, next month, next year, and then for, you know, eternity. And to me, flux pedagogy, flux leadership is precisely that, that the enterprise is equity and for, you know, an optimal development for children, you know, which all of your work has, is about optimal development of children. And I guess another connection is, and my work is also about optimal development of the people who serve children. Not that yours isn't because they can take up grit too. Um, certainly, and many do, I hear it from, <laughs> lots of leaders all over the world. Um, but it is, it is that piece that's so interesting, I think. And so I, I see a lot of entry points. And I think for me, the other piece of it is about that, that you have to be so dogged and persevere for equity. You have to have grit. You are not going to get, and your social identity, you know, as a white woman, my privileges mean I, I have to, I can be less gritty on some level, right? And so I, or, you know, I, that was a little sloppy, but you know what I mean? The conditions around me support me having the luxury to really focus on the cultivation of my grit. If we can think about the ways that I think, I think grit as a relational endeavor is so amazing. I've seen teachers all over the world team up in trying to create frameworks for the cultivation of grit in their students and then in parallel process for themselves. Hmm. So I just think there's so many possibilities. That's a perfect segue, Sharon, because what I'm so curious to know is both of you are educators. Both of you are leaders of different networks and organizations. So how do you see grit and flux showing up in your own teaching and leading practice? Um, so perhaps Sharon, since you brought that up, we can start with you. Um, how do you see flux and grit showing up? You know, when I saw that question, I thought, hmm, that's a hard question. Um, because I would actually say that it came out of my teaching. It came sort of out of that, but you know how these things are, you know, recursive. So I would say that one of the foundational concepts, the inquiry stance, and the notion of everyone being an expert of their own experience, I'd say almost more than anything else, that is the most 
directive centered intention of my teaching. It's an outstretch of who I am and how my parents raised me. Um, but it has also been about doing a lot of cultivation work to see um, you know, what I'm missing and, and what I need to attend to. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 so I would say the inquiry stance and really creating the conditions in classrooms for everyone to be um, amplified, to have their voices and their ideas amplified um, and to be seriously engaged. Um, you know, As an expert. Yeah, so I'm actually thinking of uh, an example from your QMI class this semester. So I remember that when the pandemic was announced and Penn GSE closed, you changed the assignments and the structure of your class, mm -hmm. um, which I feel is really a, a moment of flex pedagogy. Can you just tell us briefly sure. what that looked like and how that played out? Sure, I'll, I'll give you an example from the executive mid-career program where the students who are superintendents and principals and lots of other educational leader positions came on the Friday, that it, it's a weekend executive doctoral program, the Friday of the week they had closed down their schools mm -hmm. and districts. And they came into class, I was the first professor of the weekend um, at like 3.30 after they had literally done this, worrying about their students and families having enough to eat. The trauma their own trauma, the vicarious trauma was so profound that we more or less discarded the syllabus and now are doing this volume on flux leadership. Um, we pivoted from research projects that we were doing about other things to this because this is where they are. This is resonant for them. They can create and generate things that are useful for them and their colleagues in the world. And it's been a healing process. We've done away with the formal class altogether. And we meet now, we talk about the book, we're cultivating their ideas, they're interviewing other leaders. And so I guess that's a good example of, um, I, I think really of just being able to read the room with compassion. I mean, these educational leaders were so traumatized that to proceed you know, as if it was a regular old day, I think would have been really unethical. So these pivots are, that's a big pivot. There's small pivots we do all the time. It's, and as you know, it is about flexibility and it's about seeing that our students are people and they deserve us to understand their ecosystems and how that lands into what we see of them and how they show up in our classes and in their assignments. Yeah. And it was still in this larger, in service of this larger goal, which was to teach them research skills. Well, exactly. That's right. And so they're still getting all of the research skills they were going to get, the interviewing, the research question development, the data analysis, the write-up, group uh, data analysis, all of that. And yet it's in this way that is actually relevant to them. They got to choose their topics. They're working in groups. It's just a, it's an example and, and they are knowledge producers. They have so much to share and they also need to process. And so, you know, again, it's about looking at priorities and seeing, you know, I would argue that staying to my syllabus would have been prioritizing transactional, you know, fixedness. That would, I, I don't even see a place for that. So, you know, to me, it's really about, people like the word pivot, I like the word pivot, but it's, it's a pivot from a place of deep love and compassion for humanity, not just like a pivot, you know. It's beautiful. Um, and Angela, how about for you? How is grit and flux showing up in your life and work? Um, well, I'll speak to grit. I mean, actually listening to um, what Sharon did, I remember in the course that we co-taught Taylor um, to undergraduates uh, and it was the science of passion and perseverance, I remember thinking at the very end of the course, which was, you know, it started before the pandemic and then, you know, Penn uh, sent everybody home. And then that was the second half of the course. I remember thinking at the very end that I could have had more flexibility. I mean, I tried, you know, we, we, I think we did a reasonable, but I think we could have been even more um, attentive. We could have put our lecture on stress, like, right after, you know, kids that got sent home as opposed to like waiting anyway. So, um, so we're all learning. Um, but uh, in terms of grit, one of the rituals, as you know, Taylor, that we um, ended every class with was our Kaizen. 
and Kaizen being the Japanese word for continuous improvement, constantly getting feedback. And we had students, as you know, Taylor, rate the class experience from zero, total waste of my time, to 10, extremely awesome. Uh, and then they answered open-ended questions, mostly about what we could do better as a team um, for the next class. And I remember modeling to the students that, um, or just sharing and just saying like, hey, you know, when I see um, great ratings, I feel great. And when you say things that are positive, great. But honestly, when I see critical ratings and you tell me things I could do, my first reaction is complete defensiveness. And that's natural and human. And my second reaction is to listen and reflect and think, oh, right, got it. You know, I, I take too long in the beginning of class to get started, like get with the program. Like I need you to actually, you know, be on Canvas more and, you know, give more comments. So, so I do think that um, that principle of Kaizen is core to grit. So when you look at people who have passion and per perseverance for long-term goals, they're not standing still. They are, as Sharon said, like constantly learning, mm -hmm. constantly moving forward. And one way that you do that is getting feedback Yes. Not only on what you did right, <laughs> That's right. also on what you did not as well as you could, That's right. and then you keep going. So yeah, so anyway, I, I if I could replay the whole semester again, there would definitely be things where I think flux opportunities that I let pass by, um, but I do think that the Kaizen ritual was a good one. I'm going to continue yeah. to do that in the future. Uh, so just one last question that I have for you, and then we'll quickly take a few from, from our audience. Um, but I'm curious to know, in listening to each other, what resonates with you and what piques your curiosity? So perhaps, Angela, we can start with you. Um, what would you like to say or ask Sharon? Yeah, I think that um, for me, it's been a journey. I remember having a debate with another colleague of ours at Penn, um, Adam Grant, and we would guest lecture in each other's classes. And for a few years, the debate was about creativity uh, versus grit. And, you know, I think, um, you know, this is a, a version of that conversation because like there is a, a, an element of like thinking expansive. So, so Sharon, I just wanted to ask you, like when you think of uh, creativity in education, you know, what is the overlap with the flux mindset and what are your recommendations? Gosh, I love that question. I feel, <laughs> it's such a good question. Okay. I mean, I actually think flux pedagogy and flux leadership is deeply creative. You know, the work of self-reflection, reflecting on society, seeing beyond social constructions and norms is precisely creative from my, right? To see outside of the norms that we exist in, to look past our assumptions, to see, to have the courage to see ourselves anew. You know, those are the kinds of things that to my mind are so deeply creative. Self-work is creative. You actually have to unlearn and relearn yourself, your self-talk, your cognitive distortions, right? What triggers you and causes you anxiety? And, and you have to work with those things as resources for self-knowledge and self-work. And so I see that as deeply creative, um, the most creative work of all in a certain sense, because it leads to all the other creativity, right? And to me, the radical compassion and radical self-care, which are a part of the flux pedagogy or flux leadership framework, those are so much about how to create new mindsets and rituals that help us release that which no longer serves us as individuals, as groups, as organizations. How do we recreate, back to Audre Lorde, that you can't dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. Mm -hmm. So how do we create the new tools and who's the we? And flux pedagogy questions who the we is, and it questions all of this, but towards making, towards creation, towards rebuilding, towards possibility development, that's both relational and also individual, right? And those have to be in tandem. There can't just be relational models without the individual models. I mean, that's, what, that's one of the intersections I see between our, our work. So I, that's, I guess, I love your question. I'd love to think about other kinds of creativity in classrooms with you, right? Because I think there's actually a lot of teacher creativity, very specifically, I could think coming out of that leader creativity, student creativity. Um, mm -hmm. And, I, you know, and some of that is also, you know, you have to be really creative to create new communication norms, new norms in groups, especially because most of us, especially in the US, we see very few models of healthy, not racist, communication. And so that is, you know, that's, 
yeah, I'll stop. <laughs> I'm going to work myself up. And, and Sharon, um, what resonates with you in listening to Angela speak? What questions and insights are, are surfacing? The challenge is which thing to ask. So um, for the sake of time, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm really interested in your thoughts. I mean, I, I listened to your HBR quarantine interview and it was phenomenal. And I'm just curious for this audience and for me, I'd love to hear your thoughts on grit in flux, grit in pandemic. What are you thinking about it? Like, wow. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, a, um, well, I'll just give one example of how um, I think the, the, the perseverance side of grit, you know, being resilient, you know, looking for things that you can improve, you know, that I think, like, if you think like, oh, pandemic, it just like fits together. It's like, right, we should, we should, you know, find the skill sets and mindsets of resilience. And we need to, you know, improve what we're doing now more than ever. But when you think about passion, I actually think it is a little more complicated because if you are someone, say, an artist who performs in front of live audiences, or you're a chef, or yeah. even my husband's a, you know, a small business owner, and you have something that is like so important to you. It's, and I'm, I guessing this, Sharon, you might say this about yourself. It's like that what I do is who I am. I mean, this is like core That's to my right. identity, right? Yeah. I feel like that about my work too. Well, I've had the experience during the pandemic that I more or less can do what I do, right? All I needed was like this desk and this computer um, and uh, my brain but that's not true if you own a restaurant. It's not true if you're a dancer. It's not true if you're a musician. It's not true for my husband who's a small business owner. So that's where passion is almost harder to have during the pandemic than not during the pandemic. And, and I think the answer then is actually a version of this like flex, a uh, flux and grit, um, you know, uh, combination, because if you do remember like, well, why do I love, you know, to cook food? Like, why do I have a restaurant? You know, I'll just use this one Philadelphia example. So there's a restaurateur um, named Josh Kim, and he owns like the restaurant called The Burger Spot. And like so many chefs, he couldn't do what he was passionate about. And not only that, he was like quickly going bankrupt. And there was a moment of total despair, actually days of despair. And then one day he woke up and he said, I do this because I really care about people. Like that to me is what cooking is, is to take care of people. So he went back into his restaurant, he unbolted the door, he went into the walk-in freezer and he started actually cooking burgers and fries for kids in the neighborhood who couldn't access school lunch. And then he put a little note on his website. So you can actually find it if you Google like Josh Kim Burger Spot that said, if you are a person in need, come to my restaurant and I will feed you you know, God has given me many blessings and this is something I can still do. So that to me is flux, like that's pivoting. Um, but it's also grit because his yes. highest level goal was what drove that's him right. there. And that's why these things, you know, that was, so thank you Taylor for having us together because yeah. they really go hand in hand. They really do. I'm, I'm struck by so many different intersections and possible ways to actually push us to think about um, frameworks of pandemic grit quite specifically, which I think would be really, really powerful. People are looking for resources. And I agree, those of us with these privileges where our lives haven't been as unsettled, we, you know, we have the privileges to, to do that. And so um, I thank you so much for bringing us together. And Angela, I'm really delighted to keep talking with you, to talk with you now. And um, thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you Penn GSE for giving us the forum. So um, I see so many great questions from our participants coming in, uh, be but because this, this conversation was so fruitful and so generative, we unfortunately don't have time to take any questions from our participants, uh, but hopefully this is the first of more conversations to come. Um, Angela and Sharon, I wanna thank both of you so much for being here today and for joining us and sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you so yeah. much. This was such a delight. Yeah. Everyone be well, listeners, wishing you all the best. Be well, stay safe. Thank you so much, everyone. To be continued. To be continued. <laughs> Thank Short you. Short and sweet. Um, so uh, both uh, Angela and Sharon mentioned some articles. Um, we mentioned Organizational Flux, which is the HBR article that Angela wrote. Uh, Sharon was also drawing from a few recent articles that she has published about flux pedagogy. Um, we will send those out to all of you. We will also stick those in the chat box uh, in just a moment. Um, so feel free to learn more about leading with flux and grit from those articles. 
Um, I want to quickly thank the rest of the Center for Professional Learning team, Chanel Boatswain, Sarah Goldstein, Young thank Lynn, you. and Zachary Herman for your support in organizing this event. And then most of all, thank you world for tuning in. Yes, thank it's you a everyone. pleasure to have you join us uh, for this conversation. And with that, stay safe, stay well, and we hope that you'll consider joining us for more events that the Center for Professional Learning is organizing in the future. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you, Dr. Duckworth and Dr. Ravitch. And thank you all again for joining us here at the Center for Professional Learning. We invite your feedback on today's webinar at tinyurl.com slash grit influx feedback. And we also invite you and hope that you will join us for more of these opportunities this summer. Again, more information can be found at www.gse.upenn.edu slash professional dash learning. Thank you. Have a great night.